Tides. Looks, oh, <laughs> looks like the good Dr. Skiba is with us at last. Thank you all so much for your patience. We're going to go ahead and get kick started here really quickly. Um, and uh, uh, Russell, take your time, get yourself <laughs> coordinated, <laughs> take a shot of whiskey if you need it. Um, we've got a, a little group here. Um, so everyone, thank you so very much for joining us and thanks for your patience here. Um, let me go ahead and put up the, uh, the slide, slide here. All right. Um, and all right, good afternoon and welcome to the fourth installment of the Spring 2021 QSci Colloquium Series. We're so excited to have you. My name's Jude Higdon and I'm the Chief Operations Officer at QSide, which sometimes means uh, dealing with kerfluffle operations at the last minute. Um, just a few operational notes at the end of our session today, we'll adjourn to a standard Zoom meeting for an in formal cocktail coffee hour where we can chat more informally with one another. So we hope you'll be able to join us there. We'd also like to encourage any of you who are joining us today who are not officially members of our affiliate program or our consortium to consider joining. Um, I won't spend a lot of time on those, but the links to those programs are up on your screen now. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me about those. Um, Today's colloquium is the fourth of six to come this spring and an installment and exciting program we, programming we have planned for QSide in 2021. <laughs> Our colloquium uh, series features six exciting speakers who will discuss issues related to theory, activism, and technical tools to shed light on a broad range of topics related to inclusion, diversity, and equity. Please visit our colloquium webpage uh, and register for additional talks. We're also incredibly excited to announce the inaugural launch of our Data for Justice conference on April 16th, 2021. It will be a completely virtual event and will teach uh, feature talks from experts in our five research areas, inclusion in the arts, criminal justice, healthcare equity, environmental justice, and education equity, with a keynote address from Heather McGee, former president of Demos and co-chair of Color of Change. Uh, and if you haven't been monitoring Heather McGee's rising star, rising again, um, she is everywhere in the media. She had a New York Times editorial uh, earlier this week talking about her new book. Um, and uh, we are just unbelievably excited about that. Uh, our first 200 registrants for the conference, which we are getting close to, uh, will receive a free copy of, of McGee's latest book, The Sum of Us, What Racism Costs Everyone and How We Can Prosper Together. Uh, registration is now open and uh, if registration fees are a problem, we are happy to provide a grant. Just uh, there's a, a link on the webpage to uh, request uh, funding support. And uh, I am going to just jump right in now and give a quick intro to Dr. Skiba and then we'll, uh, we'll get on to his talk. So it is my great privilege to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Russell Skiba, Professor Emeritus at the Department of Counseling and Educational Psychology and former director of the Equity Project at Indiana University. His research has focused on the overuse of exclusionary discipline and in particular factors that contribute to racial and ethnic disparities in exclusionary school discipline. He was the lead facilitator and organizer for the Discipline Disparities Research to Practice Collaborative, a group of 26 national educators, researchers, advocates, and policymakers who sought to advance knowledge and practice with respect to the effects of and interventions for disparities in exclusionary discipline. He was awarded the Push for Excellence Award by the Rainbow, Rainbow Coalition Operation Push for his work on African-American disproportionality in school suspension. He has testified twice before the National Academy of Sciences and has been listed by Education Week as among the top 200 scholars in the nation influencing educational policy and practice. His talk today will address disparities in suspension and expulsion rates for students of color and how research in recent years has begun to highlight the issue and contribute to changes in policy and practice. And without further ado, I will now turn the floor over to the good Dr. Skiba. Thank you so much for joining us. And Russell, uh, if you run into any snags, just let me know and I, I'll be here quietly to come in and help out. All right. What I'd like to do today 
You know, I was real excited when I heard um, about QSide and especially was invited to be here today. Uh, the idea of using quantitative data to uh, advance uh, inclusion, diversity, and equity uh, is, is, is just, um, um, it just resonates greatly with me. Uh, it's been something we've been trying to do in the equity project uh, for years and to see uh, an institute that tries to promote that across disciplines uh, is, is just really exciting. Um, in the past, you know, in, in our not so distant past, um, data was used primarily for purposes of reifying um, misconceptions about uh, race and uh, culture. Uh, I, I think back to the early days of psycho psychology and psychometric assessment, where um, five of the first seven presidents of the American Psychological Association were also on the board of the Eugenics Society. And so a lot of the data that was collected uh, by early psychometric assessments was intended to prove uh, differences by race and even by uh, region. Um, Western Europeans were viewed as superior to Eastern or Southern Europeans. And uh, these things were um, confirmed by tests at, made at Ellis Island. Um, the English always did much better than the Eastern Europeans. Um, perhaps in part because of the fact that none of the tests were translated, um, but that into, you know, any other language besides English, but that didn't prevent uh, those folks who were so thoroughly immersed in the beliefs of the time that the white race was demonstrably superior and that all of the evidence would of course prove that um, that, that they couldn't see any flaws in, in what they were doing. And I will come back to that because I think that's a, uh, that, that's a real important point uh, about our own reflections about racism um, in our time. So I'm going to talk today about uh, equity in school discipline. Uh, as Jude said, we've um, I've spent about 25 years looking at racial and ethnic di disparities uh, in exclusionary discipline. I also, I think there's some interesting, uh, not interesting, but really vital conversation going on about policing in schools that reflects our national dialogue about policing in general. And there's some um, data that's beginning to come out about that that I'd like to, to share with you because I think that that's, that's uh, an important touch point as well. So, you know, as, as a forward, I, I wanted to touch on how I became an equity researcher, which um, turned out to be an accidental process. I, I titled this on my slide, how I accidentally became an equity researcher. Uh, I was at the time leading a grant project called Project Connect. We were trying to um, demonstrate how the impact of wraparound services uh, on students with emotional and behavioral disorders uh, in school districts in Indiana. And uh, one of the school districts we worked with is, was an urban school district. So we, we got all of, of, of their data and um, this was kind of somewhere towards the middle of that project. We were trying to get all of the baseline data on uh, different um, measures we might have about the population we were working with. And one of those measures was uh, suspension and expulsion. And the idea would be that, that if we implemented wraparound procedures that we could decrease suspensions and expulsions for for uh, the, in these urban schools. Um, 
So being a good researcher, I ran a complete set of de demographics, not only whether kids were uh, emotionally disturbed or not, also whether they were disabled or not, also boys versus girls, uh, also by race. And so we did find um, differences in rates of suspension uh, for kids with and without disabilities. Um, but then I looked a little farther down the page and um, uh, I, I was struck uh, immediately by the racial differences. The, um, you know, while uh, some of the other differences showed significance at a 0.5 or 0.01 level, the differences uh, between black and white students in terms of suspension were what my advisor in graduate school used to call the 0. 0.0000 Jesus level. Um, they were huge. And um, once I figured out that wasn't a mistake, because it was so big, it wasn't a mistake, I really determined to go back and see what other people were finding out about this. I, I really had not looked at that literature before. This was what, the, the mid 90s, early, early to mid 90s. And um, what I found was there was a, a real consistent literature showing racial disparities, uh, mostly between black and white students uh, in suspensions and expulsions. And um, yeah, you know, back then the, the data weren't as clean as they are now and the, the analysis weren't as clean, but uh, it didn't much matter because out of all of the studies that had looked at discipline by race, um, there were zero that found that there wasn't a huge significant discrepancy. So um, that got me thinking, you know, about, about why that was. Um, and especially it got me thinking, why with, with, with 20 some studies that have all found these huge discrepancies is nobody talking about this? I mean, I, if we're something else, I, I would have expected some kind of congressional investigation um, about this. Well, I, I got a hint when I, when I talked to a colleague about this, and I still remember this, uh, standing outside my, my uh, office door, and I told him about it and he said, yeah, it's a shame. And I said, what do you mean it's a shame? He said, well, you know, all these, all the, the all these kids, you know, um, and he meant black kids, all these kids, you know, they're just, they're just coming from such poor environments. And, and uh, how can you expect them to know how to behave when they get to school? And so they get suspended more. And something didn't strike me quite right about, about that argument. So that really set me on a course towards trying to explore what was going on uh, with this data. Why were there racial disparities and why hadn't we really taken them seriously? Um, so I wanna talk, I, I, the first place uh, that I started, and I think it's the first place any of us starts when, when looking at disparities uh, and inequity is what does the data say? And, you know, um, we, can, we can look at, as I did, we can look at previous studies. Uh, we can look at national databases. Uh, in, in the case of suspension and expulsion, that tends to be the Civil Rights Data Collection, or CRDC, or the uh, National Assessment of Educational Progress, NAEP. Um, as a researcher, I'm sure you know what, what the large national databases are but also state and local databases. Um, every state in the country has uh, data on suspension and expulsion, and um, that data is typically disaggregated, uh, and local databases as well. Um, I had a, and those local databases may require a little more finesse to get to. I know that advocacy groups uh, sometimes have a real difficulty in getting school districts to share their data and um, uh, often have to uh, go through a legal process to, to get those data. In my case, uh, the, the district that I wanted to get data from, I sent a letter to the superintendent and didn't hear anything for weeks and weeks and weeks. And then the superintendent came to the School of Education and gave a, um, 
a lecture to us. It was quite a good lecture about how, you know, she really wanted to improve school discipline. And, and so, you know, I was chatting with her afterwards and I said, ah, really appreciated your point. And, you know, we, we really, um, we really ought to look at, at suspension and expulsion. She said, yeah. And she said, you know, send me, send me a note sometime and, and ask for that data. And I said, well, I already did. I got the data two days later. Um, so anyway, uh, you know, what we know from the data, oh, I'm sorry. And, and once we have the data that we need to look at, we can be looking at disparities in staffing. I know QSide has done an awful lot of, of, of groundbreaking work in showing um, discrepancies in, in medical staffing. Um, and I, there has been a similar work in uh, education. We know that uh, because of, of the work of uh, American Educational Association and other Research Association and others that um, estimates are between 85 and 95% of our teaching force uh, are white. And, you know, uh, that really doesn't match up with the diversity of our student populations right now. So that's been important data. Um, the other thing that we need to be looking at, though, are, are disparities in treatment. Uh, for instance, uh, I think some of the, the medical research lately has been uh, just blown us away with knowing, for instance, that um, medical staff are less likely to give pain medication to black children uh, than, than white children. Those, those disparities in treatment right away just, just jump right out at us. Um, and in education, um, you know, those things uh, can, can say, um, for suspension, you know, what, what's the difference, different rates for um, black and white students in suspension? What is the different rates by different uh, behaviors? So are, are black students suspended more for more serious behaviors or for less serious behaviors? And, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Um, and then finally, disparities in outcome, you know, in the, um, the literature on juvenile justice and uh, juvenile arrests and arrests in school. Um, arrests in school predict higher rates of dropout and higher rates of future arrest for all students, but there is a disparity in outcome there as well. For uh, African-American and Latino students, uh, those rates uh, after first arrest of dropout and future arrests are higher. Um, so in it's particularly, you know, when I started, when we look at the um, disparities here uh, in school discipline, we've known really since 1975 that there are uh, disparities in suspension. Black students in the uh, study by the Children's Defense Fund, suspensions are the helping children, uh, were suspended about two times as frequently as white students. And studies since then have found disproportionality in office referrals, suspension and expulsion, um, corporal punishment, school arrests. Um, and in fact, those rates have increased over time. Uh, when the Children's Defense Fund studied rates of suspension disaggregated by race, the black students were about twice as likely as white students nationally to be suspended. By 2006, uh, that had grown to 3.5 times as likely. Uh, it was, it's real interesting to look at the data. It's, uh, um, yeah, I can have you imagine if you were looking at uh, a graph here that we have our bars and you can see all of the bars. And I'll see you here. here. Oh, this is really cool. Look at this. Uh, that doesn't really work, does it? Okay. Um, all of the bars across the, the, the two points in time, 1973 and 2006, uh, they all go up. You know, all students, uh, possibly because of the advent of zero tolerance, uh, have, have been suspended more over time. But black students, the rates go up from 6% uh, in 1973 to 15% in um, 
in, in uh, 2006. And those disparities have held pretty much constant. Uh, the rates for all students uh, since 2010 have gone down some, but uh, black dis uh, disproportionality in suspension remains at about three to three and a half times uh, that of whites. And that uh, intersects. And if we talk about issues of intersectionality, that intersects with gender. That um, black males are 16 times as likely as white females to be suspended. So typically it goes um, black males, white males, uh, black females, and white females. But there's even interesting data in that because the although the differences, I mean, both black males and white males are earning more suspensions than, than black girls or white girls. Um, the discrepancy for between black and white girls is actually larger. Um, yeah, the, the, the boys uh, earn more suspensions. Uh, so we tend to focus on that, right? But in fact, that disparity between black girls and white girls is actually larger. So just a couple other uh, points. We have found uh, disproportionality for uh, Latinx students, um, but that's been inconsistent. Sometimes we, uh, in some states we find that, in other states we don't. We, we have not found disproportionality at the elementary school level, but we see disproportionality at the, at the high school level. So there's a lot we need to learn that. And that's the, the inconsistency has been consistent throughout over time. Um, we, we don't seem to be settling on whether there is disproportionality or, or not for, for Latinx students. And only recently has the research been started to focus on uh, LGBTQ students. And there's pretty consistent data. There's one uh, national study down in 2000 done in 2011 that shows that. And there's an awful lot of qu good qualitative data um, uh, on looking at, at the tendency for um, uh, LGPD students to be disciplined more harshly. Again, there's issues of intersectionality there, um, uh, disadvantages how, uh, and marginalization seem to be additive. So we see um, higher rates of disproportionality among um, uh, Black or Latino LGBT students. So, okay, so we've got the data. Um, we've got the data here. Um, what, what do we do next? And, and this is where I think it's important. Sometimes we think, okay, all we have to do is demonstrate that there's a difference between these two populations. And that's going to somehow convince everybody that we, we um, ought to do something. And sometimes that's true. I mean, in the, in the case of differential receipt of pain medication for black and white children, there's not much more than we need <laughs> than, than that description. We don't really need to ask why very much. We, we, just, we just need to fix that. Um, but in a lot of other areas, um, we have to be thinking about how we interpret the data. And, and I would argue that we as researchers need to be real careful about, um, about addressing assumptions and, and what are the assumptions? You know, I realized as I thought about my colleague's question, my colleague's reaction, uh, that this was all about poor kids behaving badly, that, you know, if we think that way, if that's our, our primary assumption that we make about that data, then why do we need to do anything? You know, then we would just have to fix poverty. And, you know, as, as Jesus said in the Bible, the poor you will always have with us. And since we can't Hope, for, hope to fix that in our lifetime, then it's just a shame, isn't it? That, that, that black kids are, are suspended more. So our interpretations of the data are, are really important. And I wanna do a, um, I, wa I wanna divert just a little bit here um, 
and and I want to think about you know uh, this whole thing about about it, are disparities called by ra caused by racism uh, or or are they you know unintentional and and there's this phrase that was used a, a while ago in some multicultural training some diversity training uh, are we all racist and you know attempting to say that we all are racist even just a little bit and. I don't like that. I don't like that phrase because I think for one thing, it's really simplistic. Um, you know, I, I, I mean, it, it, you know, um, there is truth to the fact that all of us are susceptible to the disease of racism. But I think these days, my um, favorite author these days uh, on racism is, is by far and away, uh, Ibram Kendi. Uh, and his book, uh, How to Be an Anti-Racist. I have a little phrase, W-W-I-K-S, what would Ibram Kindi say? Um, but, you know, I, I, I think we need to frame that in, in personal versus policy racism. It isn't necessarily the fact that if we just sit around and acknowledge that you and I are racist at core, that that is going to enable us to solve uh, the issues of racism that are appearing to be inherent in just about all of our institutions these days. Um, so, uh, and, and Kendi points out that, that it's not even, um, it may not even be useful to use things like institutional racism, because that's kind of vague. As what, what is there about this institution that's racist? He instead says, we ought to be looking at, at racist policies. What do our institutions do to promulgate policies that maintain uh, 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 what um, Isabel Wilkerson would call a, a caste strategy or caste um, structure in our society. So I think better questions than are we all racist is first of all, how do institutional policies promote racism? And second, to, if we need to look, if we wanna look at the personal level to what extent am I still influenced by current or historical racist tropes? And that's really difficult. I mean, we, we, don't, we, we don't have that ability to get outside of ourselves, either individually or sometimes even as a society to explore uh, the ways in which we're being influenced by history, by the media, by our friends and colleagues and all of the things we have picked up our entire life. Um, I wanna illustrate this by, I was teaching a class uh, in the 1990s uh, and I was very proud of myself um, because I had been assigned to teach a class about at-risk children uh, to our school psychology students. And um, I started noticing that in whatever area it was, housing or education, or, or um, that uh, it wasn't just an issue of at risk, it was a, it, an issue of kids being placed at risk and that was mostly by race. So we transformed that course from a course on at risk students to a course on, on essentially equity. Um, but so we're sitting around uh, at, at, uh, and and, and I, I, I think this class was about eugenics and we were analyzing just how um, blatantly racist uh, folks were back in the 1920s and 30s and that didn't even realize it, um, that they were making such deep and racist assumptions. And as we finished that conversation, one of the students made what all of us thought was a pretty profound comment that, um, you know, we, we judge folks of previous generations pretty harshly, but maybe we've got racist ideas floating around right now that we don't even know about, which all of us thought was was profound at the time, and it's probably still basically true. But now I look back and I go, oh my God, the 90s. We were really, really racist. I mean, if you think about the 90s, some of the favorite tropes of the 90s were 
welfare queen that led to massive welfare reform, super predator that led to mass incarceration and zero tolerance, and Donald Trump calling for the execution of the Central Park Nine who later were released because they didn't even commit the crime they were accused of, three strikes and you're out, uh, that again contributed to mass incarceration, primarily of black uh, youth, These were mass incarceration, zero tolerance. The bell curve, uh, Hernstein and Murray's argument that, that achievement differences, uh, IQ differences between black and white students were probably due to genetics. I mean, we were really racist back then. I mean, not all of us were racist, but we lived in a, a very racist climate in the 1990s. And I, I was kind of looking around at some of the literature and, and um, I, I found uh, some pieces that, that said, you know, isn't it great? Racism is gone in our society. Blacks, uh, Afro-Americans is what this article was saying. Afro-Americans now have the capability of contributing as equals. Yeah, we haven't uh, uh, totally erased racism in our society, but we're on our way. Now that was somebody you don't want to have predict the weather for um, coming up uh, in terms of predictions. So the interpretations are, are of the data, I think, are really important when we choose to move forward with, with equity research. Um, and our research, I think, can really be driven by what are the assumptions, what are the presumptions that are keeping us from taking disparities seriously and working on those disparities. Or even if we take them seriously, where are we gonna to start to address them? And so a lot of research I've done has been about that issue and trying to deconstruct some of those notions. And of course, the biggest one uh, always has been, and, and to a certain extent still is, the notion that disparities in school discipline, in exclusionary discipline in particular, are due to poverty. That kids from uh, poor neighborhoods, poor communities, um, disadvantaged families, uh, they're, how can I say it? They're not raised right. You know, they, they have, it would be put a little more in a more sophisticated way. Um, in a journal article, we might say that uh, research has shown that um, maternal depression leads to lower levels of maternal care. The absence of fathers may contribute to, etc. I mean, I'm sure you've read these kind of articles, um, and you know that that works until you start going. Well, where did this segregation that's led to subpar and poor uh, and deprived communities, where did it come from in the first place? Well, it came, uh, unfortunately, from racism. I don't know how many of you have read um, Richard Rothstein's book, um, uh, The Color of Law. It's, it's, it's an incredible book about, um, uh, essentially about the roots of segregation in our society. Uh, he started from schools. That was his question. Why are our schools so segregated? And um, he looked at the whole history and, you know, we, it isn't accidental. We, we had this, we had this myth that, that all of the uh, blacks fleeing the South were fleeing because they wanted to escape uh, racism in the South, and they all moved because of the opportunity into uh, urban areas, uh, and they just happened to end up in segregated areas. Well, none of that's true. Uh, I mean, you know, a, a lot of Black folks, when they moved North, uh, tried to move to less urban areas, to small towns. But uh, 
there was this thing called sundown towns. Um, towns would have signs posted, you know, uh, um, if you're black, if you're a Negro, you should be out of this town by sundown. Um, and so that was uh, around 200 of those towns have been identified uh, in Indiana and Illinois alone. Um, so it's, it's not, a, it's not a, and, and, this, and kind of the same thing happened once black families moved into cities. They had no desire to be living in a segregated ghetto, but um, uh, we are all aware of the issue of redlining, that, that um, only certain districts were accepted by realtors as places they would show black residents or white residents. Black residents were actually forced out of the better areas um, through the, the rezoning to make something industrial rather than um, residential. The federal government um, made huge contributions um, to redlining through um, essentially not allowing or not making it, making it easier for white residents to get loans. So it's not an act, it wasn't an accident that all of a sudden we have this segregation, this poverty. So kind of what we're doing there when we use that, um, uh, that rationale is we're saying, um, we're, we're blaming the victim, you know, uh, those folks who are living in segregated neighborhoods still today are the victim of, of at least a hundred years of segregation about housing, and of course a lot more in terms of, of general life um, in America. The other thing about that argument that that um, that uh, uh, poverty is the main cause of disproportionate behavior, and so then disproportionate uh, suspension, is that it's just not true. Uh, we started looking in some of our research in the late 90s, uh, uh, looking at uh, regression formulas that included both race and uh, socioeconomic status and a number of other variables uh, in the equation predicting uh, the likelihood of suspension. And uh, inevitably, what we found, and what every study since then has found, and, and it's interesting to see. I've been, I've always been really curious when people are, you know, uh, looking at the same things we looked at 15, 20 years ago with much more sophisticated methods. And I'm always going, what if they overturn everything we found? Um, but it, it, it's not the case. I mean, consistently, even with our most rigorous studies that have happened most recently, um, poverty is not the sole cause of disproportionality. Yes, yes, poverty is a predictor of whether kids are, will be suspended. Um, poor kids are uh, encounter the disciplinary system and are suspended more than, than um, higher income kids. But that does not predict racial differences in suspension. Um, and, you know, that's a, that's a, I think that's a tool that uh, a lot of investigators don't think about using, that when we have uh, a number of variables like that uh, in a multivariate equation, when we rule out, when we see that race remains a significant contributor, um, it's not just that race is a contributor, it's that race contributes in and of itself to disparities in school discipline. Okay, I just want to talk about one more. I'm, I'm really kind of going on along here because um, I know we were supposed to have discussion. I want to talk about one more thing with respect to that and that's the, the belief that, um, that, that disparities in discipline are due to behavior um, of, of black students beha simply behaving, misbehaving more. Uh, in fact, the data has not proven that out either. We did uh, a study called uh, The Color of Discipline in which we looked at the reasons that black and white students were um, 
referred to the office. And what we found was that uh, white students tended to be, and this was in a, a large urban district, uh, white students tended to be referred to the office more for things like vandalism, smoking. Black students were referred to the office more. And there were a lot of things like fighting, that there were no differences between black and white students. But there were these eight differences. And black students tended to be referred more than white students for um, loitering, um, disrespect. In other words, things that we couldn't see. That was the major difference we saw. And, and um, it's hard to say who was behaving more or less from that, but it was really clear or, or which were the most serious offenses because, you know, um, uh, defiance, which was one of them, could be serious, right? Uh, but what was really clear was that uh, all of the things Black students were referred more for were more subjective. They really were dependent on the perceiver, uh, whereas the things white students were suspended for, were referred to the office for, tended to be more uh, things that we could all agree on, vandalism or smoking. So, and again, the research since the color of discipline, uh, as it has even gotten more sophisticated, uh, has, has confirmed those findings that racial differences in rates of suspension and expulsion are not due to differences in behavior. When you control for types of behavior, race remains uh, a significant predictor of who will be suspended. So um, I'm gonna stop with that line and just briefly mention one or two more things. Jude, can I take a minute or two more before we have discussion? Okay, thanks. Um, and that, that I think are also really important uh, in, in our data having legs, in our, in our data being able to make, make a difference. One of them uh, is where we publish. Um, uh, you know, I, I was told when I was in graduate school that uh, it takes 20 years for uh, a finding about, um, that would, would change practices in real life. It takes 20 years for that to go from research to actual practice. Um, I didn't believe it when I was in graduate school. Certainly, it can't be that bad. But I, I, now I've been uh, with a few years under my belt. I, I think it might be true. Um, you know, some of us don't want to wait that long. I would assume that most people on this call don't want to wait that long for research to to filter its way into the public consciousness. So it's really important to look for a variety of dissemination outlets in our research. Uh, yes, of course, we still want to publish in, in peer-reviewed journals. That, that, that means that our data is, that, that our, our findings are true, that our findings have been reviewed. Well, not, always, not always true, but it increases the likelihood that our, our, our findings, our findings have been reviewed by, by credible peers, and, and this is, it's most likely in that way to be true. But we also really want to take advantage of other venues as well. Um, Web-based reports, um, magazine articles, uh, um, op-eds, if it's something we care very deeply about. Uh, I wrote an op-ed very early on about zero tolerance in, in the Washington Post. That, uh, and actually my biggest, some of the um, best responses I ever got was an, uh, a, an article on zero tolerance in File Delta Capin, which is just, it's, um, it, it's not a totally practitioner-oriented magazine, but it is a, a much more informal venue. Um, also, the last thing I'll say is uh, we need to be talking with people on the ground, in the grassroots, uh, people who are out there. Um, I have found working with civil rights advocates to be um, such an inspiration to my work. Um, I can sit there in my office and, you know, look at a piece of data and say, mm, it doesn't look quite right and generate some hypotheses about that. But my hypotheses about that are going to be real different from black and brown uh, activists who have lived this their whole life 
and are working with people in the community and students in the schools. Uh, and I have so many times, um, and this is another place where I think our assumptions and our background and our experience come into play as a white male. Uh, what looks really radical for me uh, is something that um, my black friends and colleagues go, God, you're kind of, you're kind of vanilla, aren't you? Um, I remember at one point, oh, this was a, a while ago, well before Black Lives Matter, I was thinking about writing a book and uh, about disproportionality in general. And I, I wanted to call it unplanned conspiracy. And um, <laughs> white colleagues I brought it to said, um, well, that's kind of strong to call it a conspiracy. And black colleagues I went to said, uh, what do you mean unplanned? <laughs> so um, I, I think it's really important to, to, um, to listen and understand the perspectives of other as we, others as we go into our research. Uh, uh, you know, and I, I can't see anybody out there. I don't know, you know, uh, what proportion of you uh, are, are white or black or Latino or, or Asian. But I think we need, especially uh, the, those of us who are white, need to look very carefully, even if we think that we have uh, a long history, even if we think that we're, we have been allies, um, there's just no question that, that privilege has caused us to be able to hang on to some assumptions that may or may not reflect what people who have experienced this their whole lives are living. So I'll stop there. Um, and I hope it's been somewhat helpful. Outstanding. Well, thank you so much, Russell. So we do have a number of um, questions that have popped up throughout. So I'll moderate those for the time being. Some of them are mine. So I'm going to take some executive privilege on this. I want to um, acknowledge a really <clears throat> um, uh, interesting call out that uh, Elizabeth uh, uh, said, it, which is um, a film she recommends called Push Out, which is a documentary. I looked it up. Um, it's new to me. So thank you for that one, Elizabeth. Um, but it is a film about um, the disciplining of Black girls in schools. Um, so that is uh, from, from our, our colleagues um, there. A couple of things that came up for me. Um, one, I'm just making some connections back to some other speakers that we've had. So some of you may have been at um, the talk in the fall um, with, um, I'm blanking on her name, but um, the, the, uh, the director of um, uh, one of the projects at Robin Hood in New York. Um, and she talked a lot about, um, in some of the ways that you've talked about the sort of um, issues related to over-disciplining um, of, of black uh, children particularly, and sort of the connection, sorry, thanks, Chad's texting me in the background, uh, Sam Tweedy, thank you, Chad. Um, um, and that's up on our YouTube channel, but she talked a lot about the active process of, in, of impoverishing black children. Um, and the data that shows that sort of within social class, um, black children have a much higher rate of being downward mobile in terms of social class and wealth, and they lose wealth at much higher rates. Mm -hmm. um, and sort of is tied back to a lot of behaviors in how people, um, how they're sort of worked, addressed in schools. Um, and, and so it, that's just the connection that I was drawing about um, some of, you know, what I heard you saying. One of the I, questions I've got, so please go ahead. Yeah. Um, I, that's interesting, Im impoverishing. Um, I, I actually, when, when, you, when I hear that word, I think about impoverishment in a different way. And that is through school staff uh, and particularly school police um, making assumptions about the intersection of race and poverty where they don't really have any data to support that. That, you know, that teachers will assume 
because a kid is black and they're having trouble that they're coming from a poor family or a single family and they're single parent family and they're not getting any support when they have no knowledge whatsoever about that student's um, economic background. And the same thing um, in the literature on school policing that um, one set of, of researchers said that it was very common among SROs to engage in what they called racial tropes uh, and about you know, those connections between poverty that all these black kids must come from a very poor community. I, we had did one um, qualitative study where we were uh, interviewing uh, teachers about you know, why they thought there was disproportionality in suspension. And this one teacher said, well, you know, it's cause they, you know, I, I'm, this is, I'm colorblind. I don't see color, you know, but then down at the end of that paragraph, she said, and you know, the, the problem is, you know, it's the problem is the, the poverty. It's cause they come from that black culture over there. <laughs> like, what? You don't see color, but they come from a black culture. Okay. I'm sorry. Go ahead and finish up. No, not at all. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I, I feel you. Uh, one of our other speakers, Aruna D'Souza, said something in her talk um, uh, um, recently that as soon as somebody says, I don't see color, you know, the next thing they're about to say is the most racist thing you've ever heard in your life. Um, uh, so that's interesting. Um, so it, let me take a question from the field here. So, um, uh, somebody said, okay, so a lot of folks who are here with QSide, they're going to be quantitative scientists um, and just wondering. So if you wanted to tell people who come from that quantitative background what we should be doing, how should we use those superpowers, those scientific superpowers um, to sort of ask and answer the biggest and most compelling questions? Um, you know, how, what would you, what, how would you recommend and guide those of us who are in the quantitative fields to, to, to use those skills? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I've been, you know, I, I've done a little bit of qualitative research uh, in my life, one or two, and I always, I always find those helpful, but all virtually all of my um, work has been quantitative with pretty big data sets. Um, and I guess what I would say is, uh, is kind of the two points, I probably could have made these a lot more clear if I'd had PowerPoint slides today, but, but uh, <laughs> um, is, is first of all to, you know, to use your data to figure out what the actual problem is, what is the extent of the problem, where is it occurring, um, you know, is it, is it um, you know, in staffing, is it in treatment, is it in outcome? Um, but, but then, I, you know, I, I don't even think the right question is how can we affect the big problems of the day? I think, you know, you sort of see a problem. I mean, if you, you have to decide, well, am I going to be looking at, at disparities in, in medicine or housing or education? Or, I mean, obviously you have to pick those. But once you see those disparities, then I think we have to uh, interpret that. And I think we have to be really aware of what it is that would prevent people from understanding the racial inequity that is most likely at the at the heart of it there the colorblind philosophy which you know we make fun of but it's still inherent in in much of our discussion folks you know um, um, I always predict that if I'm <laughs> in a group of, of, of white educators you know, the topic of race will come up and then they're going to try and run away from that as, as quickly as they can. It's not, it's not so, you know, it's not so blatant as I don't see color, but it's just like somehow the conversation veers off of those, of those racial disparities. And so the question, the important question is, why is it veering off? Why is it that, that there's, there's discomfort there? Why is there, is it a, is it, is there an underlying belief that this isn't really about race, it's about the behavior of the of the group that that is is dis disparate. Is it is it that we think it's about poverty, and to to find that out through conversations with colleagues, through our own hypotheses, through the literature, and then address those questions, and then say, well, is it really about poverty? Is it really because of the victims themselves 
um, or you know, any other hypothesis that might be standing in the way. And I think that's when we start to make, um, to make some dents. My, my goal through most of my research has been to, to try to kick the legs out from under all of those arguments so that there aren't as many barriers to people recognizing that there is differential treatment of black students all the time at all levels in our educational um, system. Amen there. Um, well, so I want to be respectful of everyone's time, including yours, Dr. Skiba. Thank you so much. Um, and sorry about the uh, calendar kerfluffle, but life in the time of COVID. My, my, um, and, and we roll with fun. That's not your fault. <laughs> That's all good. Um, I want to thank uh, Dr. Skiba for joining us today. Thank all of you for joining us. Um, I did post the link to the Zoom meeting. If you're able to join us for uh, coffee or cocktails afterwards, we can discuss this. One thing to uh, uh, remind everyone who may still be on the call here, um, we have just launched uh, our, a Slack channel. It is only for affiliates and uh, consortium members, and it will be a place where we can begin to have some discussions around these topics, hopefully begin to bring together activists, researchers, much like Dr. Skiba was just talking about here, to start working in big broad ways around these questions and to generate some additional research. So please look to the newsletter if you haven't already got it, um, join us and we can give you more information about that. And um, the talk will be posted um, tomorrow on our YouTube channel. So uh, subscribe there if you want additional information. Thank you so much for this really informative talk. We appreciate it so much. Have a great evening, everyone. <laughs>